Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. This is Tom Gretsch of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. We've got a great panel of, uh, of folks for discussion purposes regarding uh, the current situation with career services and careers in general. Um, welcome, everybody. We'll do some introductions in a second. Um, you know, it's interesting. We are, we are in very much uncharted territories. I had a conversation before this um, broadcast started off live with some of the assembled guests, and these are times we'll tell our grandchildren about. I think truly, truly remarkable times across the board. And life for the last couple of months has been somewhat of a game of whack-a-mole. Every time something pops up and gets, cut and gets solved, another issue pops up. And uh, the one example I, I like to use, because he's a, a, a headstrong young man, is the guy that owns Nears Tavern. This guy almost folded back in January, kind of <laughs> came back together with some funding he got from him, you know, internally, opened up only to get robbed about a month ago. Uh, this guy is the Energizer Bunny, and he's one of my personally everyday heroes who does not know when to say when. And it'd be a great example for other folks um, in our city and in our, in, our, in our county of Queens. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce a couple of our guests. Um, we've got Doreen Clark, uh, Rebecca Davidge, Sarah Tapia, and Ethan Chazen, uh, all experts in their fields. Um, I want to also uh, make it a point to introduce and give the floor to our friends uh, up in Albany. And let me just say this, um, you know, a lot of people in government, I know they do it and I know they work really hard. Some of them have a predisposition to help certain categories. The two we have tonight have become friends, not only of mine, but of the chamber. They get it, folks. They get it. They realize that small businesses are, in fact, the backbone of our economy. They realize that the small businesses can make or break a community. And I'm going to go off script today for a second, just before I introduce Senator Adabo and Assemblywoman Stacey Pfeffermato on the theme of restaurants. Restaurants are near and dear to my heart. For those that would see me from the waist down, I like to eat and I like to eat a lot. And in Queens, we have lots of those choices. Um, but that's kind of where the joking kind of ends. There's 6,000 restaurants in Queens County. We have estimated since the end of April that up to half of those may never see the light of day. And why that's so troubling to me is because when people come to this country or this city from wherever they come, come from, um, they don't need to speak English, nor have a GED, or know anybody per se to go wash dishes, make rice, boil potatoes, you name it. They come to those communities, whether they're Peruvian, they go to a Peruvian place. If they come from down south and they might be of African-American descent, they go to Jamaica and go work at the door restaurant, right? A number of places they go to to go to work and learn a trade. My fear is that with these restaurants closing, there's a whole echelon of people that are not going to be available to live the American dream. And that's why it's so important that we work hard to help them by supporting them locally whole local, buy local, shop local, as well as press our elected officials in Washington, D.C. to pass the Restaurants Act. If anybody has any questions about that, I'd love you to just Google Restaurants Act, Gretsch and Queens Chamber of Commerce. We've been all over it. And I know two of our elected officials tonight have also been very supportive of that. So without further ado, I want to turn the floor over first to Senator Joseph Adabo. Senator Adabo, thanks so much for being here. And thanks for your dedication to our community. Oh, my pleasure, Tom, and thank you very much. And to all at Queen's Chamber and to all helping out today during the webinar, thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, Tom, I got to thank, again, the Queen's Chamber has been a great resource for our restaurants, for any business in Queens. We've been really struggling since the pandemic really started. And uh, for those workers involved, because for every business, there's jobs attached to it, local residents who work at these uh, local businesses. So thank you again for being that great resource as we work together to getting uh, people back on their feet throughout the pandemic and you know with this resume and interviewing skills uh webinar uh this is so important as we again be creative that the pandemic has forced us to be creative uh, getting people to, uh, jobs and looking for areas of growth where the jobs exist 
But that resume, that, that interview, it, it's that key that opens the door for an opportunity for someone to provide for themselves or their family. Uh, and we just, again, we're so thankful. And again, I'm thankful for working with the Queen's Chamber and my colleague, Stacey, uh, for bringing this uh, webinar uh, to our people today. Because again, I think it's so important and critical. Uh, I, I appreciate the timing because I have a virtual job fair coming up on Friday, October 23rd. Um, and I'm hoping people participate in that because again, it's a way of trying to get people back on their feet and bringing the opportunities to them as the pandemic has dictated. So again, working with the partnership here, Queen's Chamber, my colleagues and those individuals, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and I wish everyone much success going forward. Senator, you, you, you kind of nailed it on the head. Um, the importance of having those skills before you go out there. You know, it's interesting. I used to drive around the borough uh, all day, every day, and I would see help wanted signs. And it would always drive me crazy that there's still people out there trying to hire people, trying to connect the dots. And now it's a totally different situation. And, you know, from places that you represent down by the uh, Resorts World Casino, New York City, they're getting ready to open up their hotel. That place went from, you know, them trying to find employees to now having a different challenge, right? But we're here to support them and all the employers of Queens County. So, Again, Senator, thanks for your efforts across the board. Um, right. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Stacy Pfeffer Amato. Um, I've had the, the, the benefit and the fun of eating at the restaurant that her husband runs um, down in Rockaway. Um, he's a gentleman. Uh, the pizza's fantastic. But so I, I say that not to advertise Frank's Pizzeria necessarily, but she walks a mile in the people's shoes that she represents, the small business owners, working men and women of the county. So without further ado, Assemblywoman Pfeffer Amato. Thank you so much, Tom. It's great to be here today. And Joe, of course, I love working with you. And to the panel, it real, I'm really excited about uh, today's webinar. Um, as Tom just touched on, I am married to a family of uh, my husband, Frank, who has a family-owned pizzeria, and it absolutely has educated me um, unbelievable, and certainly during the pandemic, seeing what happened. But what, what it, why I think this is so important today is I've seen when he's hiring a new pizza man or a counter person and how people come in with nothing, you know, a scratch piece of paper with their information on it. And I think every job you should give your best to. So if it's a resume or just, you know, a couple of jots, on a piece of paper about yourself, but professional. And I think in this market right now where people might be leaving maybe the restaurant business to go to other places, I think to, to develop that skill, how to present a resume or how to present yourself and how to interview is so important right now. And then for the people, I don't wanna say the old timers, or folks that are really finding that they got laid off, how do you reinvent yourself or take your information and, and put it out there in a resume and just quickly, um, myself, as someone who worked in the restaurant business, I remember my first interview for um, a job, I actually talked about my restaurant experience. My, it must have been in college, they told me to write down that I worked at a restaurant on my resume and all the tr more traditional people like, you don't do that. But it was that I had people skills, that I know how to delegate. And my first interview, no one answered my, co my GPA, we talked about working in the restaurant, which Tom, it was the Pier 92. And my whole conversation was about my restaurant experience and my craziest story. And P.S., I did get the job. No one asked me my GPA. There was nothing else about college. It became the most natural interview. So when we thought about this, uh, you know, how, what we could do to help our people, I, I do think this is the greatest thing we could do about some skills. So I see Ethan got really excited there. So I'm really excited for this panel. I know it's going to mean a lot to our constituency. To the chamber, I thank you for being a top resource for us in Queens. You know, uh, um, in these times, and I find our offices, you know, people go who they can trust. And Tom, 10 out of 10, even the 11th time, we trust the chamber. We trust the information you bring, what you fight for. So you're, it's easy to support you because you brought the chamber to such a different level and you just really truly represent what it all is Queens. So with that, uh, to the panel, I hope you have some really good challenging people out there that have never done a resume or their interview skills. Uh, quietly, Joe and I are gonna, we're gonna touch base with you another day so we could do work on ours a little bit. But thank you again for this opportunity and good luck to everybody and go out there and get a job. 
<laughs> Assemblywoman, thank you so much. Your, your kind words touch me because you know what? I got to say, it's not, there is no I in team, right? We, uh, I have a great team. Jackie uh, does a fantastic job. Mohammed as well. We've got a great team of people that get it. I've been trying to instill in them and they, they took to it really, really quick during this pandemic that, um, you know, the term essential workers truly was and is an important thing for the doctors, the nurses, the FDNY, the NYPD, God bless them all for what they did. I'm still kind of scratching my head about what happened when we used to all bang pots and pans at seven o'clock to come and down on everybody, right, as a group. That always makes me crazy. But also, when it comes to essential, if somebody's paying the mortgage, if somebody's putting bread on the table, if somebody's out buying a pizza, your husband Frank's out there employing his people, right? I don't think there's anybody that's not an essential worker to their family. Every worker is essential. And I think we need to drive that home to our other elected officials and some people in some quarters, especially in some appointed positions, about how important it is to consider all of our workers essential. You know, we don't talk a lot about the tax revenues that we're losing necessarily through payroll taxes and so on. We got to get these people to work and getting prepared and having your best opportunity is such. As an example, believe it or not, in the middle of this pandemic, there are a ton of companies hiring people for certain skills. I know a bunch of accounting firms that are buried trying to process triple P, whether the, whether the triple P will be forgivable or not, right? This coming end of year, while 2020 in my lifetime and probably everybody else's has been the worst year ever in many respects, right? The tax implications for what the heck's been going on are astounding. Is the loan forgivable? Is it taxable? How I paid my people? It's a, it's a plethora of information that's needed and people who are tax experts will thrive. The other area is in, I happen to know this because my members are busy as heck trying to hire people, is the security business. During those terrible times of June, they needed to hire people to protect property in certain areas, but now more than ever, they wanna make sure, people wanna make sure their businesses are safe. You know, WatchGuard 24 seven is the company. John Rafferty is the president and owner. He's got over 500 people. He's trying to add more. So at the end of the day, there are opportunities, but nobody wants to hire down. They wanna hire qualified people that come to the job prepared. So I could go on about that for a long time, but I promise you, I will not. Um, I want to really thank Assemblywoman Pfeffer Amato, uh, your family, Senator uh, Adabo, thank you so much for what you do. We marched together in unity on uh, Cross Bay Boulevard to get the restaurant supported. I appreciate that, and it didn't go unnoticed. Um, so thank you. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, next up is a gentleman that we know pretty well at the chamber, want to know him even more. And that's a young man named Ethan Chasen from the Chasen Group. Ethan, welcome and uh, tell us your story. Get our people fired up. Let's get them jobs. Wait, wait, wait. You want to hear my story? I I'm sorry. That's, that's a New York City reference going back to the films in the 80s. So I apologize to all you millennials and Gen Z. So, okay, first of all, everybody out there, lock and load, focus. New York City boy, Jew and Italian, we're going to hit the ground running. Um, First of all, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jackie, for inviting me. I grew up and lived in New York City my whole life. And unfortunately, this has been an amazing year for me. And I say unfortunately because I do two things. As a New York City coach, I work with two groups of people. I do career coaching and have done it to about 15,000 people. Um, and I also do entrepreneur startup and small business growth. Both groups of individuals are suffering, as is probably every single human being, as we figure out how to live through a global pandemic. So if you're like anybody else, your world has been flipped upside down. And so I'm not going to talk to you tonight in my special allotted time about resumes or interviewing. You've got experts who are going to come after me. Um, what I've been asked to talk about, or what I've been allowed to talk about, excuse me, is a, a kind of funny thing that most people, whether you're in your 20s or 70s, or anywhere in between, whether you're uh, an immigrant right off the boat, or if you lived here your whole life, it's something called personal branding. Politicians do it, chamber executives do it, pretty much anybody who has any interaction with any human being brands. And right now, in the world of global pandemic, 
where we've got 25 or so million people either unemployed or many more millions of people underemployed. What I want to talk about tonight is how do you brand yourself for career and business and professional success? There may be somebody attending tonight who says, nah, I'm not buying it. You're the marketing guy. You do this for a living. I'm not a brand. I'm a human being. Well, newsflash, every interview you have is a branding encounter. Every relationship is a branding encounter. Every interview, you, you get the theme, the, the thread here. Every encounter with any other human being is an opportunity to convey the essence of what Tom has said over and over and over tonight. What the hell does it mean, part of my potty mouth, to be non-essential? BS. We're all essential. But how do you convey, how do you articulate the core essence of you? So here we go. Everybody ready? Is everybody ready? Yes, sir. All right, rock and roll. Now you're cooking with butter, as my grandma said. Your unique value proposition is the set of your background, experience, training, education. You worked in restaurants. Great. Miss Assemblywoman, I worked in retail. It was a crappy job, but my older sister was a regional manager back in the 80s at Benetton. I got experience in retail, which, yeah, I know, right? You can take that anywhere. Your brand, at its most core, elemental, basic level, is a promise that every encounter, that every interviewer, HR manager, potential boss, your brand is a promise that every encounter or experience that anybody has with you is fundamentally three things. And I, I want you to think about that on this webinar tonight. Forget about the resume. The resume is just a sales tool. I know I pissed a few people off on the panel. Your resume is a sales tool. It can say whatever you or other people write in it. Your interviewing is also a sales meeting. What I want you to think about at a more fundamental level is your unique value proposition Every encounter that you have with anybody else is an articulation of your brand as three core things. Are you invaluable, memorable, unique? See, it's interesting because somebody said something earlier about being remarkable. I, I, I'd ask for like a vote, but I'm not going to do that whole technology thing on, on the computer thing. But how many people think remarkable is amazing? Because it ain't. Remarkable is that which others talk about. What's your brand in terms of the things that make you invaluable, unique, memorable? So right now, I'm gonna drop some knowledge on you. Before your resume, before your interviewing, where you learn from other people in this panel how to do a behavioral interview, where you prove based on things you've done before why you're imminently qualified to achieve success in the role you're interviewing for. But put that aside. I want you to get started with an idea, whether in your early 20s or late 70s or anywhere in between, you want to write down a one sentence description of your personal brand statement. It is what we refer to in the trade as your elevator pitch. It's when somebody says, hey, Sarah, tell me a little bit about yourself. Talk about a loaded question. Tell me about yourself is in one sentence, using your personal brand statement as your elevator pitch. What is it about you that's your passion, your dreams, your exceptional awesomeness that makes you ideal for an opportunity that may not exist yet that you're interviewing for. Let me just kind of get a little bit of closure. And uh, Jackie, if you could give me some kind of a ping when I'm getting close to my allotted end time, just give me the hook and I'll get off stage. Um, what we know in the best of times job market wise, and ladies and gentlemen, we're in a depression, so we're not there. We know that a very small percent of all available jobs are advertised. Statistically speaking, no more than 10 to 15% of those jobs, whether they're in security or accounting, whatever Tom said, we know a really small percent of jobs are advertised on Indeed, et cetera, et cetera. What we need to understand is that you have to start cultivating your network of relationships. Most positions are not formally advertised, so you want to figure out what your personal brand is. You want to articulate that in a one sentence declarative statement of your passion, expertise, and ideal opportunity. And then here's my advice to you. Do not job seek by applying for jobs. It's like 
following Alice into the black hole, into, into, into the rabbit hole. You're not going to get responses. Not only are you applying for the job, but hundreds, if not tens of thousands of people are as well. So instead, I want you to think about the magic, the golden goose of your job search, where you take your brand, everything about you that's unique and valuable, memorable. Think about all the work you've ever done. Think about four or five key successes that you've achieved that you want to talk about. Go out and find 12 to 15 organizations in the five boroughs or wherever you happen to be job seeking. Find 12 to 15 organizations. That would be a great match for you. Here's how the math works. What three or four industries are you really interested in? Security, accounting, sports medicine, um, fashion, music. Find three to four industries that maybe are not necessarily firing people left, right, and center, hotels, hospitality, bars, restaurants, food service. Find three or four industries and then find five or six or seven organizations that you say, you know what? I'd really love to work there. Those organizations, workplaces, respect employees. They're all essential. And their organizational culture has values that match to what I'm looking for with my personal brand. Then it's a love match. Marry your personal brand to those 12 to 15 organizations. Research the heck out of those 12 to 15. Find their challenges, their problems, their products or services, their key competitors. What are the problems that keep their either owner or executives up at night that your brand is a set of solutions to the problems they're facing? Then you want to reach out to the senior most person, whoever she or he or they are, who's responsible for that area, marketing, sales, customer service, whatever area that you might work in and go to that senior level executive having done the research, reach out to her or him by phone, introduce yourself and the goal is to get a 30 to 45 minute conversation. Um, I'm gonna pause at this point and just ask real quickly, Jackie, how much time do we have left for my segment? You have like seven more minutes or so. Seven more minutes, thank you, Mohammed. So, what I want to do is I want to kind of lay the landscape. I want to paint a picture. So if everybody's comfortable, I want to walk you through an exercise. This is, what's, this is what Seth Godin, a famous marketer, referred to as you as a purple cow. So I'm hoping some of you have heard the phrase purple cow. Maybe, maybe not. Imagine your brand is a purple cow. You're driving down a country road. There are cow pasture. There's roaming grass fields on the left, roaming grass fields on the right. What do you see with a field of cows? Black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, right? Doreen, right? Black, white, black, white, black. You look on the other side of the road. Black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. Oh my God, look off in the distance, Senator. There's a purple cow. The purple cow stands out because it's fundamentally unique. Nobody's seen anything like that before. What's your purple cow? Think about your background. Maybe you grew up in a mixed, um, mixed ethnicity household. Maybe you emigrated to the United States, but you come from another country with a different culture. Maybe you studied abroad. Maybe you speak multiple languages. Sure, nobody ever asks about a GPA, but maybe you have some weird kind of academic pursuits, certifications, training, upbringing. Think about all those things that make you as unique as your fingerprint is. What you want to do is be the purple cow by differentiating yourself from anybody else at that job fair that the senator has so graciously arranged. So whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, I don't care what the platform is, you're going to have an opportunity to speak to potentially hiring managers of organizations who are looking for qualified people. What's your purple cow? See, we call that in marketing your point of differentiation, you don't want to be talking about yourself in the same way others are. The only way to figure out how to nail your personal brand is to spend time thinking about everything you've ever done and thinking about throughout your career, whatever the job is, what, whatever you've done, what were the challenges that you faced in those jobs? What actions did you take to overcome them? And what results did you achieve? Your brand messaging has to be loud and clear. I, state your name, am a set of solutions 
to the challenges that your organization faces. How do I know that? I've researched you and I understand what you're going through. And oh, by the way, I can achieve success for you in this role because I have a demonstrated track record of success in other organizations. So the notion of your personal brand is, is pretty important. It's the fundamentally, if you think about all your job search, all your career, all your professional activities, this is the same for a job seeker, somebody who's looking to advance her or his career, somebody who's looking to save their business or grow their business or transition or move between industries or sectors in their business pursuits, doesn't matter. The notion of a personal brand has universal application. So what I'd like you to do as you're getting ready for this virtual job fair and any conversations you have with anybody else who's in a position to help you is to think about when they ask you this question. Get ready. Here it comes. So tell me about yourself. <laughs> That's a loaded question. But what they're really saying, if you strip that away to its bare essence, can you please articulate your personal brand statement that makes you unique, invaluable, memorable. So that's what I want you to think about. Because once you nail that down and do the research into industries that are hiring and organizations that would be great to work for, then it's simply a question of creating a love match between you and your background and experience and what organizations are looking for. So I've been monitoring the clock. I know that I was told I had seven minutes. Five and a half have gone by. I'd like to, Jackie, bank the remainder of my time and open up the floor, if you're amenable, to a little bit more question and answer. Or if anybody needs further clarification or has any questions related to branding or anything else related to job searching or career development or professional pursuits. Thank you, Ethan. Um, you're going to stay with us. Yes. Yes, you're going to stay with us. And we have some questions coming up from Facebook Live, but also we have having problems with the communication. At uh, this moment, I will. Can I speak too quickly? No, it oh. was perfect. It was perfect. Okay. A pure New Yorker. <laughs> I would like to introduce now uh, Sarah Tapia from the Queen's Workforce Development. And Sarah, please, thank you for being here tonight. And please, introduce, you can introduce Doreen and Rebecca. Sure, Your sure. Team. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you, Ethan, by the way. That was great. Um, that's a tough act to follow. So I'm going to try my best here. Um, but good evening, everyone. Um, just like Jackie said, my name is Sarah Tapia. I am the Community Partner Coordinator for the Workforce One Industrial and Transportation Career Center. Our main center is located in Jamaica, Queens. And just to give a very brief um, background, uh, because my colleagues will go into more detail, uh, Workforce One is a city-funded program, and our goal is to connect New Yorkers to job opportunities. So we understand um, the pandemic has affected many job seekers at this time. So we are here to be able to connect uh, job seekers to opportunities. And so um, in regards to how we do that, we do partner with a number of employers. Um, our center specifically partners with employers in skill trade uh, areas. And so um, we do hope for anyone that is watching, right, uh, to take advantage of the PowerPoint that we do have to present. Because uh, not only do we connect job seekers to opportunities, but we do have career readiness services available as well. Um, and I am here with my colleagues this evening, Doreen Clark, who is our career services manager, and Rebecca Davidge, who is our career advisor. Um, and both of, uh, both of the ladies here tonight with me also work with me at our Queens Center as well. So I'm pretty much gonna disappear right now. I'll be in the back doing all the technical work, but I do wanna thank you again for allowing us to participate. Okay, so um, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, my name is Doreen Clark. I'm the Career Services Manager at the Queens Workforce One Industrial and Transportation Career Center. And with me is one of the career advisors on my team, 
She's a right-hand person to me. We work very closely together and well together, and that's Rebecca Davich. Um, at what, 5.55, my internet connection went down. I was sitting, waiting in the room for this to begin, and everything, my electricity went out. So I'm not on my computer. I'm on my iPad because if I, if I stayed in my computer room and I'm in my dining room, because if I stayed in my computer room, I would have had no lights. So please, please, please forgive me if there's any noise that happens or my dog barks or anything like that. It's not that I'm not professional, but I have to do what I have to do here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start the, um, the PowerPoint presentation that we have. And at the end, we'll open it up for questions. And if anything happens in between then, Rebecca is right here. And if I go out, she's going to fill in and she's going to take you through. Thank you, Rebecca, for your assistance. Um, so Sarah, you know, she told you a little bit about Workforce One, who we are. So Workforce One is a service provided by the New York City Department of Small Business Services. And we're here to help prepare and connect qualified customers 18 years and older to job opportunities across New York City. Last year, we helped over 31,000 New Yorkers become employed, get jobs. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, we also partner with the New York State Department of Labor and other city agencies and community partner organizations to provide New Yorkers with access to services and resources um, that might help them within their job search. So um, right now, I think Sarah mentioned this, but everything that we do is being done virtually. Okay, um, so next slide, please. So as you can see here, this is a map. And what this map does is give you an idea of uh, where we are located. So we have 18 career centers, six are hub centers, six are expansion centers, and then we have the specialized centers and the sector centers. We are, I am, part of the sector centers. Um, but hub centers offer the full set of services like job matching, career development services, and connection to training. Expansion centers focus on specialized positions and sector centers focus on jobs in specialized sectors, um, for example, industrial and transportation of which I'm a part of. And also we have a healthcare center as well. Next slide. Okay, so who are we, right? We're specialists in New York City's growing industrial and transportation sectors. We connect to over 500 companies in transportation, manufacturing, construction, wholesale trade, and transportation support. And we're your connection to a career in the industrial and transportation fields. So just a minute to tell you a little bit about the type of job opportunities that we have um, in, in the sector that I work in, in the industrial and transportation. We have um, many commercial driving positions, like CDL A, B, or C. Right, we also have non-CDL positions. We have skilled labor positions, plumbers, welders, carpenters, electricians. Um, and we also have um, like warehouse positions as well. Um, and we're your connection to a career. Next please. So why a sector center? Sector centers um, came about because they provide industry expertise access to jobs and high demand occupations. You know, in the city, we always need skilled laborers because we're always looking to bring up new buildings and to put people to work. Um, we provide sector focused workshops and other services and advancement through training. So we're here to connect job seekers with employment opportunities. How do we do that? Right, we do that by assisting and applying for jobs or upgrading your skills, right? Or helping you to develop your career goals, okay? And how do we do that? We do that, our approach is to partner with employers in various fields for job growth, 
The employers tell us what their hiring needs are. Who are they looking for? What experience level do they have to have? What skills are necessary to do the jobs that they have? Right? And we then take that information and we bring it back to the center, right? And we help to prepare the members that come through our doors, virtual doors at this time, because everything is being done virtually. And we help to prepare those members to be successful in their interviews so that they are matched to jobs that are right for them and that they are placed in jobs. So there's really only two key things that we work on. One is recruitment and the other one is candidate development. So, okay, next. So in terms of recruitment, recruitment is our account managers who are constantly looking for, they're constantly doing business development to bring on new companies who are looking for employees or customers to fill their job openings. Um, and then our account managers are constantly uh, setting up recruitment events so that customers who are interested in applying for the jobs that we have can then be pre-screened or screened for the jobs. So a pre-screening is when an individual meets with an account manager, right? And a screening is when an individual meets with, uh, let's say somebody from the HR department of an organization. And we provide both of those kind of recruitment events, right? There's also one-on-one -on -one interviews and there's also, uh, what's the other one? The group interviews that you may go to. So this is just two types of different types of interviews that you can participate in. And I want you to keep that in mind because as I go a little bit further into the PowerPoint presentation, you'll see where that makes a lot of sense and you have to pay attention to what type of interview are you gonna be going on. So I talked about the one-on-one -on -one with the account managers. So the career services team, of which I'm the career services manager at the ITC hub in Jamaica, New York, um, we provide initial assessments, we provide career advisement, career development, we have workshops, both live, facilitated, and remote virtual workshops. All of our workshops are virtual at this point, but we have some that are live and some that are not. Okay, and then we provide training and social services as well, right? I will definitely be sure to um, share my contact information. I think it's at the end of the presentation here, but if not, uh, Sarah will be happy to put it into the chat box for me or to share that information. So what's an initial assessment? Initial assessment is when a customer enters Workforce One, usually for the first time, right? And they are set up with a career advisor to speak to them about their goals, right? We, we wanna know, what are your skills now? What is your experience? Can we take a look at your resume to see if it's representing you well? Or do you not have a resume and maybe you need assistance with getting a resume? Um, what is your short-term goal? What would you like to be doing in three to five months? What's your long-term goal? What would you like to be doing in three to five years, right? Are there any other services or trainings that we might be able to assist you with um, on the journey to reaching your goal, right? And what's a very important is that anytime you come to Workforce One, you never leave us without having a next step. What is your next step, right? We will always provide a next step to you. Next. So in terms of candidate development, we offer workshops, right, in various ways. So uh, we offer live facilitated, facilitated workshops in interview skills and resume upgrade. The interview skills provides you with, it. first of all, it gives you an opportunity to work with a live uh, facilitator um, and the kind of questions that Ethan had said. So tell me a little bit about yourself. We talk about those questions in detail, right? And we actually help and assist candidates to be able to prepare to, to answer those questions and to make sure that they can 
differentiate themselves from the rest because it truly is all about differentiating yourself from the rest. As we know, many, many people are looking for jobs. What's going to make you the candidate that stands out in the crowd, the purple cap? Sorry, Ethan, but thank you. <laughs> um, career advisement, again, we talk about short-term and long-term goals. And then in terms of training opportunities, we have training grants, we have training programs, we have various, you know, types of trainings that we can talk to you about. We have a cable communications training program. We have a commercial driving training program. Um, grants, that in, in particular, grants mean we will help you to pay for the training that you need in order to get your license or your certification in that area, free of cost to you. Right, so there are those type of trainings. We also have a new um, part of the Workforce One website called the Careers Discovery NYC um, program, which is a wonderful program and it's very new. With Career Discovery NYC, if you don't know exactly what you want to do, but you want to take a look at the different types of training programs that may be available for you to take advantage of, right? Whether it's healthcare, whether it's something in transportation, industrial and transportation, um, production management, all of those types of programs are available to you if you go onto the website and you click on the tab, the tab for Career Discovery NYC. What is really important about Career Discovery NYC is it actually before you say, yes, I think I'm interested in participating in that training program, you can actually take some online classes, maybe 15 hours of online instruction and classes um, to see, does it really hold your interest? Is it really thought, is it really what you thought it was gonna be? Or no, that's really not for me, right? Before you get too embroiled into the program and then you find out this is not really for me. So it's a wonderful thing. And if you have the opportunity, please visit the website and take a look at it. Next, please. So the workshops that we give are acing the interview and, and resume upgrade. As I mentioned before, they're live and remote. And we also have another platform called Impact You Virtual Training. So Impact You is, let me see, how would I say it? It's training, next, the next slide, Sarah. It's training whenever you want it, right? It offers self-paced training. It accommodates all learning styles and you can access it on the computer, mobile, desktop, over your phone, whatever is best for you. And the best thing about it is there's short videos. So like seven minute videos on interviewing skills. Um, so that right before you go to an interview, you can review this video just to make sure that you're on top of your game. Okay, next please. Next. Okay, so some of the ways that you can connect with us is through our, works, our website, nyc.gov forward slash workforce one, where you can register as a member and create an online profile. You can search for job opportunities there, yes. You know, this is the career services, so I'm kind of looking at things and talking to you th from things, you know, in reference to career services, but we are job placement. Right. So I want that to be very clear. Right. If you go into our website, you can look for jobs there. Right. You can um, enroll and register for recruitment events. Once you're a member of Workforce One, you can come and talk to the career services team so that we could assist you with your career um, interests and your career de development needs. Next, please. So I want to stop here for a minute and I just want to ask, how much time do I have left? Uh, you have about 15 minutes. 
Un- until seven. Minutes. Or as, as much as you need, if you don't need okay. that minutes. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, so what I want to do now is I just want to take a few minutes. That probably won't be the whole 15 minutes. But I want to take a few minutes to talk to you about the importance of interviewing and the importance of your resume. Um, And I've chosen to talk about virtual interviewing, and then I want to talk about live in-person interviewing, and then I want to uh, talk a little bit about the resume. Right, so for virtual entering, who knew that as of March 18th, we would be in this virtual world? Who knew that Seven months later, we're still in a virtual world, right? And who knows how long it's going to be before things get back to normal. And you guess what? A a few months ago, everybody was saying the new normal, the new normal, the new normal. I agree. It's a new normal. I don't think we're ever going back, not totally, to where we were again, right? So you haven't looked for a job in a while. You've never done a virtual interview. You think it's the same as interviewing the way that we would normally do it, and it's totally not. Right? It's a whole different ball game. You might have noticed that while I was waiting for my turn to do my presentation, I kept playing around trying to figure out, okay, so can you see me? Am I centered? Am I high enough? Do I, I put some books underneath me? No, nope, that's too high. Let me take some books away so I'll be high enough. I'm trying to make sure that, notice back here, it's a white wall. Unfortunately, there's some pictures on this wall, but basically it's a white wall. So there's a lot of things that you have to think about when you're doing a virtual interview, right? Prepare, prepare, prepare. Practice, practice, practice. Always plan on arriving five minutes early to the virtual interview. Even if you sit in the waiting room for five minutes until they actually acknowledge you and bring you in, be early. If you're on time, you're late, right? Be early. Set up your shot, right? What does that mean? There should be, I mean, if, you, if your computer or whatever you're on allows you to be able to use virtual backgrounds, then find a background that you like and try to have that in the background of your shot, right? But if not, try to find a blank wall, a basic blank wall, right? You don't want any distractions. You want all eyes on you, not trying to figure out what's the picture back there, what's going on with that, right? Always dress to impress, right? Don't think that because it's not an in-person interview that you don't have to show up with your A game right? Um, you, your hair should be neatly groomed. If you have a beard, it should be neatly groomed. Your attire should be professional. Um, the smile should be more than evident, evident. Everything should be on point, right? And they really only need to see from your shoulders to your head. They don't necessarily need to see what you're wearing. Um, shoulders down, but I have a a little point for you, a pointer for you. Make sure that shoulders down and especially waist down is still professional and business attire, right? Because sometimes you have to move, sometimes you have, you may have to get up, you don't want to get up and have to, and have pajamas on, on the bottom, okay? Ensure you're in a quiet space where you're not going to be on, in, interrupted by other people, no children that need you, no dogs that are barking, although I just apologize if that happens to me. But you know, you want to be in an unobstructed, quiet space where you can focus. And always remember to smile. Okay, because they can see the smile. You don't have to smile from the time you get on to the time you leave, but remember to smile. Okay, and practice, practice, practice. Two days before you actually have your virtual interview, start thinking about these things. We always tell people for the live in-person interviews to set out everything the night before. And believe it or not, it's really a good practice because when you don't do it, that's when the next morning you can't find the tie that you really wanted to wear, the last um, 
last stockings that you have, you went to put them on and you ripped them. I mean, things just happen, right? I remember one time I actually went to an interview that I was going to have. The interview was in the city and it was back in the days when people used to wear sneakers and then they would change and they would put on their pumps. And I have a habit of having pumps in like the same pump, black, white, black, brown, and navy blue. So I must have picked up a black one and a navy blue one. So when I got to the building for the interview, down in the lobby of the building, here I am getting ready to change from my sneakers to my pumps to find out one was black. Thank God one was left and one was right. But one was black and one was blue. And I just couldn't, I mean, they, they may not have even noticed it, but I couldn't do that. And I was very early. I was more than 15 minutes earlier. So I actually had to go around the corner and buy a pair of shoes, a new pair of shoes. Um, but even that, don't do anything. You're on for an interview the minute you walk in the building or the minute you walk into the, the room, the waiting room for a virtual interview. You are on. Okay, next, please. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about an in-person interview where you're actually going to go to the location to meet with the individual, right? Um, always arrive 15 minutes early. No earlier. Definitely not later, right? You don't want to arrive too early. It's not a good thing, right? So if you arrive too early, look around the community. Look around across the street if there's a Dunkin' Donuts. Maybe you'll go across the street and have yourself a cup of coffee and go over your resume or go over your notes, okay? Always, always, always leave home with all of the contact information for the interview that you're going on. Because just as I said a little while ago, things happen that you don't think are gonna happen, like traffic, like an emergency, like an accident, that's going to mean that you're going to be late for the interview. It is never acceptable to be late. It's never acceptable to call after the interview to say, I'm sorry, but I got caught up in traffic, right? The minute that you know that it looks that you're not going to be able to be there on time is the minute that you should reach out to the contact to say the, to them, you know, unfortunately caught up in, there was an accident doesn't look like I'm going to make it. Just wondering, would you allow me to come in a little bit later on this today? Do you have another opening available where I can come in then? Because I'm on my way and I don't want to turn around and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Okay? Dress to impress. What does that mean? It, it depends on what kind of job you're going for, right? Um, if you're a skilled laborer, you're probably going to have a hard hat and your, your um, steel-toed shoes and maybe your tools with you, right? If you're going to another type of job, maybe you're a driver, you don't have to put on a business suit like you're uh, a banker, right? But a nice, clean, pressed, white, button-down cotton shirt with khaki pants and a sensible pair of shoes, groomed, you know, very nicely groomed is wonderful. Try to not use a lot of perfume, not wear a lot of jewelry, uh, many things like that. Try to keep that to a minimum because it only serves to distract, right? And you don't want any distractions. You want all eyes on you and what you're saying and what you bring to the table. Always bring additional copies of your resume with you. Right, because you never know. You may think that you're meeting with an individual and you may get there to find out that you're meeting with a group, right? And always be sure to sit straight, make eye contact, and there goes that smile again. Only you can bring that smile, right? And then there are times that you go to interviews and they say, well, let me see what you can do. Usually it's a skilled labor type of interview. Let me see what you're able to do. Can you pick up that bucket and walk up that ladder, uh, that 50 pound bucket and walk up that ladder and bring it back down, right? So be ready because they may ask you, especially if it's a manual type of a job, a skilled labor type of a job, they may ask you, 
to do something right then and there. And you want to be ready to, to be able to do it. Next, please. And now I'm going to talk about the importance of a good resume. And again, Ethan, I'm going to say thank you so much for that introduction because you, you, you took it home, right? Your resume is your calling card, right? Many times people take resumes and they say, they make one resume and they send that resume to 50 employers, same resume, 50 employers, right? When a resume really should be targeted, targeted to you, right? And, and, and introducing you in the best light possible, but also, you know what? You have the key to make that resume amazing or outstanding, right? Because they tell you what the requirements are you know what they're looking for, right? In a job description, they give it all to you. So if you take that job description and says, yes, I have this, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that, then you're going to create a resume for that job around the skills and experience that you have and that you know that they are looking for and that you know you can fulfill. Right. If you send out a resume to 50 companies and it's the same resume, it's going to go into the same pile. Right. It will not be the purple cow pile. You have to stand out from the crown. You have to. Right. Your personal brand statement that Ethan talked about is very important. So tell me about yourself you have to be able to give, we call it the elevator pitch, right? What makes you the person I want? Not only want, I need. What makes you the best person for this job? It is a marketing tool. It represents you. It's important and imperative that you take the time to make sure it's the best representation of you your experience and your skills. And if you do it right, it might even set you up or show them what your next career move will be. So next please. Okay, so how do I register? I hope after everything that I've said um, that I have at least tweaked your interest about coming to Workforce One, whether it's for job opportunities, it's for training or is it for career services? We do it all, right? So if you're not already an existing member of Workforce One, the way that you can register is by visit, visiting the Workforce One website. You click on find a job, you select create an account, you fill out the requested information and you check your inbox for the confirmation code, okay? Next, please. So make the most of your Workforce One experience. And by the way, let me just say this. This is not a one and done. Like you come to us one time, we, we help you. Maybe you find a job, maybe you don't find a job. You get the information, you go home, you think about it. You don't connect again. We are here for you, right? So if you need us now or you need us six months from now, if you need us for jobs or you need us to help you to connect to other resources, we are here, okay? So when you come to Workforce One, keep an updated resume on hand, always be professional and positive and always stay connected. Next, questions. Does anybody have any questions that I might be able to answer? Yes, Maureen, we have some questions on the chat. Actually, the questions are coming from Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to all the panelists and one is to Ethan. Say that again. One of the questions is for all panelists and one question is for Ethan. Um, just a second, let me see. One more question from Facebook Live to Ethan and Doreen. Are there 
industries in which a personal brand doesn't matter. And I think just to kind of jump in, Doreen, because while you were talking, I, I chat messaged that. No. Your personal brand has universal appeal, whether you're job searching, changing careers, re-entering the workforce, whether you're starting a business. It's universal. Your personal brand is, this is my statement about what I'm passionate about, what I excel at, and what I have to offer. Yes, I agree with Ethan. And I could, it's funny because, believe it or not, right before I had to um, attend this, this workshop here, I was speaking to my daughter, who's thinking about a career change. And I was talking to her about personal brand, right? And, you know, she's an artist. So she was giving me some ideas about something that she wanted to, to do with t-shirts. And I said to her, I don't see anything that you just said to me that brings me back to you as the artist and your business, right? I said, there's no way that you could put anything out in the world without it having your, your branding on it so that people know who you are and where to find you and what you're all about. I mean, to amen, Ms. Doreen. It's your personal brand is an articulation of what sets you apart. Sure, but it's about, it's basically everything that you stand for. And again, if anybody wants to know how to do this, because it's not easy, um, just let me know. I'd be happy to talk you through one-on-one -on -one, or you can email me. To, I can send you my ebook on this. Um, but you got to go through the exercise because just the process of thinking about that forces you to think about the value that you have to offer others based on the value that you possess. So that's really, look, I mean, it's great if you have a job, but guess what? A job is called work and work sucks. And that's why so many people who have jobs hate their jobs. But if you're doing what you love, yes, you'll never work a day in your life. So here's, here's my little tip, and Doreen, jump right in with Rick. Here's my tip to anybody, whether you're, because I saw one of you as a student at, at, at Queens Community College. I saw some of you are finishing up school. I don't care what, you, what your background is. Where you, the things you love to do that you're really bad at, nobody's going to hire you. The things that you're really good at that you have no interest in, you don't want to do that. It's the intersection of the stuff that you love, that you're really good at. Hello, that's your dream job. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give a plug for my team, my career services team at Workforce One. I work with one, two, three. I work with a lot of people. There's a lot of us, but I'm just talking about my immediate team. I work with three of the most, I don't even know what the word is, compassionate, smart, caring individuals. And we all do what we do and we absolutely love it. There are days that it feels like work. I'm not gonna say that it doesn't. But in general, I think we all leave at the end of the day knowing that we have made a difference and that we have helped people along the way. And that's what we all are. That's that's our purpose. Each one of us may tell you something different, but you will never hear anything from either of us, all four of us, that doesn't say we want to help people, right? We want to help people to live a better life, to be economically stable and sound, right? And we get to do that every day, Monday through Friday. Thank you, Doreen. And we are here also to help people not only to find a job, but to brand ourselves and to be better every day. And that is why Queen's Chamber of Commerce is very proud to present this type of webinars. And thank you, Senator Adabo, for inviting us to bring this important topic to have this conversation tonight. Any final remarks, uh, Senator Adabo, Ethan, Doreen, you are welcome. Well, again, I want to thank the Chamber and Workforce One, Ethan, everyone involved here. Uh, this is so important, and I do hope the people watching found it uh, helpful. 
and certainly wishing in, again that much success. If anyone has any questions regarding the virtual job fair that I have going on from Friday, October third, uh, 23rd to Sunday, October 25th, please call my office at 718-738-1111. Again, 718-738-1111. But again, I wish you all much success and stay safe. Thanks again. Thank you, Senator. Doreen, any final remarks? Uh, no, just thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, and just remember Workforce One, if you need us, we are here, right? We're only a click away, Thank so you. remember us. Thank you. Assemblywoman Stacey Pfeffer, are you still connected? No, but thank you for all your help and for inviting us to have this presentation. Oh, oh, Ethan, oh. it's all I yours? <laughs> uh, first of all, again, thank you to Jackie. Thank you to Tom for inviting me. Thank you to everybody who's put this together. I, I actually do one tip for maximizing. If you're going to go to a job fair in person or virtually, you can either own the process or you can fail at the process. So when, when Senator Adabo puts this together, here's my tip to you. If you can find out in advance who's going to be at the job fair and you can understand the kind of people they're looking for you need to figure out by doing research what it is those problems that these organizations whether they're in queens or beyond you need to research this and virtually you need to be prepared to have a conversation around being making it obvious that you research the challenges they face and ask meaningful questions during the virtual career fair, say, why are you here? What kind of people are you looking for? What are your challenges? Ask one or two questions about your research you've done, and you literally want to leave them with a complete understanding of your purple cap. So uh, to that point, Ethan, and thank you very much, if I may, uh, my office will be willing, certainly in an effort to help those seeking a job. We will provide you a list of the vendors if you should call the office. Wonderful. Or email. We will give you a copy of the vendor list. Remember, as it gets closer to the, to the 23rd, uh, Friday, October 23rd, we'll have a more complete list. So if you can wait as close to the virtual job fair as possible, uh, we'll give you that list. But anyone who inquires about the list of vendors who are gonna be at the virtual job fair, we'll give you that list. And Workforce One will be at that job fair as well. So Thank we're you. We're very excited for that, yes. <laughs> and we will advertise the event and send us the flyer as soon as you have it ready. 